regarding the observations the four lectures so far if not we'll proceed Invoice, any questions? I shall proceed. No such questions. Okay, fine. So we go ahead. <coughs> Okay, uh, in the rest of this course, we are basically going to be looking at uh, trying to explain uh, what we have seen in these observations. And uh, very often the phrase used to describe what we are talking about is uh, mathematical modeling. Now, Today it's used in uh, many fields, and you will hear it uh, used with some of oh, when you enter typically a biology or chemistry or geology corridor. <clears throat> I don't recall this term being uh, very big when I was a student, and uh, these words are shetis. So when he was a student in the late 70s or early 80s, this word was not a very big thing. Nobody said that he does modeling, but today you kind of end up distinguishing yourself whether you do modeling or not. But uh, I don't think what I have been doing changes uh, has changed over time. And, uh, so it's useful to know what it is that we're talking about when we talk of mathematical modeling. So the example given here is uh, useful for us. We have uh, looked at uh, temperature and uh, salinity data. So suppose you go out on a ship, use a CKD, it's conductivity, temperature, depth. So from conductivity and temperature you get salinity and uh, from temperature and salinity you can calculate density. Then you can get those pressure surfaces relative to some level of no motion and uh, calculate geostrophic flows. So this has been going on for well over a century now. So this is uh, typically what you would see if you were to plot temperature profiles. And this is an observation. So you can come back and uh, try writing up uh, what you are seeing. <coughs> it's a good story. It's an observation of nature. And uh, that is what we do. Uh, but it's not complete. It's not complete because uh, if you look at this profile and you look at uh, the changes at the surface, they are not small. The change is from almost 26 degrees just under that to maybe over 30 degrees Celsius. So talking of 4 to 5 degrees Celsius changes in temperature here. It's probably even more when you go into the subtropics. But uh, as you go down, the range of variation narrows. And at 1000 meter depth, the temperature is about 8.5 degrees Celsius. The fluctuation is about 0.2 degrees Celsius. That's it, not more. So we would not like to just uh, say that the temperature at uh, 1000 meters depth is 8.5 degrees Celsius and that its standard deviation is 0.2. Uh, we would also like to know why is this temperature 8.5 degrees Celsius? Why is it not something else? Why is it not 5 degrees? Why is it not 12? And why is that band so narrow, no matter where you go? So this is a well-posed question. It remains to be seen if we can answer it. And then the question is, how does one go about answering this question? And it's important that this question be answered, because if you don't know why it is 8.5 degrees Celsius, you will not be able to tell if it can change. 
over the time span and over the region in which you made this measurements, you get this temperature of 8.5 plus minus 0 0.2. But 50 years from now, with all that we are talking about, what is it likely to be? Will it still be 8.5 plus minus a bigger range? Will it be something else plus minus uh, standard deviation 0.2 or something else? Or uh, will uh, it remain as it is? And if you want to answer that question, then uh, it's not enough to make the observation. You need to understand why it is uh, 8.5 degrees Celsius. So what is going on in nature is what was answered when we describe the profile. The second part is why did we observe that in nature? This is important. And this course is about being able to give explanations for what we are seeing. Um, this is the important part. Suppose you want to explain something. You are having a discussion. Let's say you tell your friend that uh, this uh, paperweight, if I throw it, it's going to move in a certain way. There is likely to be a discussion. You may even have an argument. But uh, in this discussion, if you cannot provide any foothold, anything that either of you, both of you can hold on to, that you agree on, there is no way to converge to any sensible conclusion. There must be something based on which you are arguing that both of you are willing to accept. In any negotiation, that is the basis. There is at least the acceptance that you will come to a settlement. And if you have to come to a settlement, there must be some basis on which you can proceed. Typically, in law, you have a legal framework. You have a set of rules based on which you can buy property or sell property and so on. There are certain things you can do, certain things you cannot do. Likewise, there are certain pathways that nature will take. There are certain laws that nature has to obey. It cannot do whatever it wants. And if we are in agreement on certain uh, things, then it is possible that uh, we can come to some understanding. Because we may be explaining these observations with very different ideas. Our uh, explanations may be different, but irrespective of the explanations, they still have to satisfy the same laws. And there are certain laws that are very basic. So if you can start with something that both agree on, that's uh, not disputed by either, then uh, <coughs> you could start with these assumptions and uh, you come to certain implications of the assumptions. So if there are certain laws, certain rules, then based on that you start your discussion and you come to certain, uh, you infer something from them, you proceed building the case and uh, as in a court of law, you will come to certain implications. So if the implications are consistent with observations, then the explanation is correct. It holds as long as nobody comes up with an observation that violates that explanation. The moment it happens, the explanation has to be sought all over again. So this argument or explanation as it is called consists of these steps. You start with something, say some rules, some laws as we shall see, acceptable to all. Then you come up with implications of these acceptable rules. And then you check if these implications are consistent with observations. If they are consistent, then the explanation is correct. This is what we do all the time. And that's what we'll be doing throughout the course. Scientists also carry out this exercise, but in a little more precise fashion. Um, we start with statements that are universally accepted and preferably in the kind of science that we are talking of, physical sciences, with statements that are quantitative, that have numbers associated with them. We need statements that are quantitative in order that different explanations can be tested to see which is better. Because 8.5 is a number. It's a very precise number. So if I have more than one explanation, and it's possible based on the same set of laws, same set of rules, you can come up with different explanations. Then as to which explanation holds, the test to determine that is consistency with measurements or observations. Now, it may well be, and this is typical of, uh, in particular, the kind of field we're talking of in geophysical fluid flows. 
you will come up with explanations that don't give you 8.5 as the answer. Maybe it will be 10 degrees Celsius, maybe 12 degrees Celsius. We then accept the first, in preference the second, because it's closer to observations. It's probably more likely to be right. You can't be sure, but it's probably better. So we need to start with quantitative statements that lead to quantitative implications. This is necessary because the test of an explanation lies in its comparison with observations, and this comparison will not be possible if it is just hot air. Arguments based on a uh, chair that you set on or brute power or whatever are of no use. We, in physical sciences, we need numbers from observations. So observations must be quantitative, and likewise, the explanations that you come up with must lead you to numbers. They must be quantitative. Now, this is something being attempted in biological sciences too. And typically, that is where the word modeling comes in. In physics, it's been on since a uh, very long time. And uh, it's never really called mathematical modeling. So we've been doing that for a long time, and we continue to do what we did. It's just that we have a new, more fancy name given to it. OK, so we're going to start with universal laws that nobody argues against. Uh, if we don't have these acceptable laws, no argument is possible. Now, there are many kinds of laws. Laws are restricted. And uh, the moment you say, I'm going to uh, base my arguments on this particular law, you restrict the framework of the argument. Now, it has to be within the restrictions imposed by that law. You cannot go beyond it. One of the laws, for example, that we will uh, be using is uh, Newton's laws of motion. They have their limitations, Newton's laws. But what we are looking at can be explained within the limitations of these laws. So that's perfectly fine with us. We don't need to look at the theory of relativity. The circumstances under which these laws break down do not matter to us. So as far as we are concerned, Newton's laws would be one set of the universal laws that uh, nobody argues against. Nobody, for example, has shown that you need to relax Newton's laws to explain what you're seeing in the kind of flows we are talking about. Based on these laws, we come out with implications quantitative. And we compare with these implications with observations. The comparison decides the quality of the arguments that build the implications from these universal laws. So two persons could argue from the same universal laws and lead to two different implications. Happens all the time. Examples include theories by Lino, more so for the Indian Ocean Dipole. Many phenomena that uh, we encounter in uh, geophysical flows. We have more than one explanation. Question is which is better? And the best test, in fact, the only sensible test is to see which one leads to better comparison with observations. That's it. So what we do is put this uh, language into a code. You have what's called a model. And throughout, we'll be building models, variety of models in this course. It's nothing but something that starts with the universal laws of nature. And uh, we look at one particular implication of these laws. So that's the implications of the model. Then you compare them with observations. If it's good, you're done. If it's not good, you go back. You rebuild the model. So the test is with observations. The theory has to match observations, not the other way around. That has to be remembered. Oceanography can be understood most of the time by using the universal laws that were put together by Newton about 300 years ago, by adding one or two others. These laws forming the foundation of oceanography are the following. The first is the conservation of mass. Mass is neither created nor destroyed. And uh, in the kind of flows that we are going to be looking at in the ocean, we are going to make an even more restrictive assumption. We are not going to talk just in terms of conservation of mass. We are, in fact, going to assume that you cannot compress water or salt water. Very good assumption, but not strictly true. As you go down the uh, 
deeper into the ocean, you find that it can actually be compressed. So if you look at uh, data from a CTD, you can actually calculate different types of density. You can calculate densities that take the pressure effect into account, and you can calculate density that does not take the pressure effect into account. And this compression leads to uh, a change in temperature too. So these are things that have to be kept in mind. There's a small compression effect that comes into play. Uh, this happens basically because though for most practical purposes at one bar, atmospheric pressure, that is surface pressure, water is incompressible. 10 meters in the ocean is equal to one bar. Every meter is one decibar. So every 10 meters into the water, you are talking of an increase in pressure equal to that of the atmosphere, the entire atmospheric water, atmospheric column at the surface. So when you are at 1000 meters, the pressure is 100 bars, plus that one bar at the surface, which is now part of your area. So we are talking of uh, very high pressures. So conservation of mass, and we shall assume the fluid to be incompressible. Newton's laws of motion, and uh, the last ones, the laws of thermodynamics. The only other classical laws are the Max, uh, Maxwell's laws of electronics, but uh, we are not concerned with them. To understand why temperature 1000 meters is 8.5 degrees Celsius, we need to look at the implications of these laws to construct our model, and then look at its implications. The model yields a prediction. It actually gives you numbers that can be compared with the measurements. It is this need to make a quantitative comparison that makes it necessary to examine the implications of a model. Um, I'm not going to go over this business of calculus because I think you people know about it. So we'll skip that. There's an interesting chapter here that deals with uh, why you need differential equations. Basically, when you're talking in terms of rates of change that are not uniform, you need calculus. If, for example, you were uh, looking at motion, you look at, uh, say, a vehicle moving at a uniform uh, speed, then when you're talking in terms of distance, you can multiply the speed by the time that has elapsed, and you get the distance traveled. But what happens when the speed or velocity is changing with time? That is the need, that is what brings in the need for calculus. So this is dealt with here in terms of filling a tank, but something much uh, more simple also leads to the same thing. OK, now this is a point that's of interest. The talk here is of a tank, but uh, that's not of interest. The trouble is that when you look at the equations that we're going to see for fluid flows, they really can't be solved as they are. Uh, using the methods that uh, have been used in mathematics for a long time. It was not until the advent of the modern computer that these equations could be solved directly. Even now, we end up making a lot of assumptions, a lot of approximations, and as we shall see, what are called parameterizations. Let's not worry about that uh, word. We'll come to it later. But uh, the trouble is, if you cannot solve it uh, using paper and pen, using uh, integral and differential calculus, then uh, you need to solve it on a computer. And when you solve it on a computer, you use what are called finite differences. So in calculus, you go from uh, delta t to the limit. So if you have uh, delta h by delta t, when you take the limit delta t tending to 0, you get uh, dh by dt. When you take finite differences, you reverse the process. Now, not only are you looking at uh, differences, you're also looking at differences that are finite. And that's typically what uh, has to be done for most oceanography problems. OK. So we have a physical system. We have seen what the observations are like. We have posed a few questions. 
I hope we'll answer some of them by the end of the course. All of them are useful questions. And there are many more questions that need to be answered if we are to make sense of what's happening in the Indian Ocean. Uh, we construct a hypothesis. Part of it is already done for us in the sense that already fairly well established and there's no reason to believe that uh, they don't hold, that we need to add something to those equations. So that's not something they're going to worry about in this course. We have equations that are consistent with uh, the hypothesis that uh, is based on conservation of mass and momentum and maybe thermodynamics. Uh, we solve these equations and uh, then compare with the observations. That's it. If it's good, we are done. If it's bad, you go back. You have to construct the hypothesis all over again. So maybe we are trying to explain the Wittke jet. We come up with a certain set of equations. We come up with some explanation based on that. We compare with observations. We find that doesn't quite match. Then we go back. We may end up having to make a very different set of uh, assumptions in comparison to what we did in the first instance. OK. I think this is a useful point. So there's, an, there's a well-defined intent behind writing the equations that we're doing. The intent is to make a precise system on how the system behaves. An equation, a differential equation, is an extremely precise statement with very precise uh, implications. So it gives you a precise answer that can be compared with observations. The answer can be either right or wrong. Very often, you won't be able to decide if your solution mimics the observations or not. When you write a paper, you're going to push the idea that your solution actually matches the observations. Every observation has an error associated with it. No observation is perfect. It gets worse when we're looking at oceanography. The data will show you a scatter. This you're used to. Even um, potentiometer experiments in school and college, they give you a scatter. You never get a beautiful straight line on which all the points fall. So you will never be able to measure, say, sea level exactly. There will be an error bar associated with the measurement. In the Indian Ocean, for example, the higher variability that is there, the seasonal cycle is dominant, not the mean, implies that the error bar in the Indian Ocean is higher than in the other basins. So you could draw contours at uh, any level you want. Your software will do it for you, but it's meaningless. That's the key thing. The same thing holds for uh, CTD data. You go out, you make measurements along the section, say across the West India Coastal Current. You can plot the dynamic height relative to the level of promotion at any arbitrary interval. The software will do it. You say 0.1 dynamic centimeter, it will do the job. But is 0.1 a sensible number? Are your accuracies good enough to permit contours of point one? The data from time series measurements suggest, suggest that that's not true. It's something like five dynamic centimeter. And very often, the measurements that you get turn out to be within that five dynamic centimeter. There's not much of a statement that you can make after a hell of a cruise. So this is a catch. You may actually put in a great deal of effort, but at the end of it, it's not easy to make statements. So often you will often, you may find that there are situations when two curves pass through the error bars. You have an error bar associated with the measurement. And maybe there are two ideas and both give you results that are not bad. Both are within the errors of the measurement. Then uh, you have a counter argument to that of the reviewer. You can say, look, you have a good idea, but my idea is as good as yours. This tussle goes on and there is some subjectivity involved because in nature you cannot make a precise measurement. And we are not talking of uh, something as uh, deep and philosophical as Heisenberg's uncertainty principle. We are talking of something much more mundane. Even in uh, classical fluid flows, you cannot make a precise measurement. Every measurement has an error associated with it. And uh, maybe the measurement systems improve and allow you to choose between two hypotheses. So you may find that uh, there are older papers where there is a theory popular for a long time that has been discarded. It doesn't mean that that uh, person who did the work was not intelligent. It is just that uh, the theory was good enough at the time. 
and uh, there is not much reason to come out with a theory better than what is needed. You won't be doing it. <coughs> So you need to have a hypothesis that allows you to check out <coughs> what you are doing and that hypothesis must be stated in an unambiguous fashion. It is not maybes, could be, would be, should be. If they are there then you are not making a precise statement. And if you are not making a precise statement anything is acceptable. <coughs> so you can say it may be due to upwelling, it may be due to uh, entrainment, it may be due to something else, advection. And uh, finally if someone comes across uh, <coughs> comes in later, does a very precise calculation and shows which is important. So it shows that advection, not appealing is important. You can see, look, I said that. It may be advection. You have said everything. You have said, you can buy this share. You need not buy this share. Both are equally true. But you have made that statement. So you can make a claim either way. But that does not translate to good science. And the reason to be quantitative is uh, words don't allow you to become as precise. So we have to think in terms of numbers, especially in the physical sciences. Okay. Okay. Now there are models of different kinds, the statistical models, the deterministic models. We are going to be looking at the latter. We are going to look at what are called differential equations, precise statements with precise implications. Uh, so the game is tougher. Okay. Now in this uh, chapter, the model was developed in the specific context of a tank. What was done is to construct a model that is an idealization of what happens very often in nature. Suppose you have a dam that holds up water on one side and releases it on the other side. The amount of water that comes in is not controlled by tap but depends on precipitation, which involves a larger error bar when you are talking of measurement. The amount of water that is allowed out is controlled by sluice gates. That is not very different from the tank. The basic principle for this problem is the same as the one we applied earlier to the tank. Mass is conserved. So we can use for the dam the same framework we did for the tank. The flow will be controlled at times, uncontrolled at times, but the model is still applicable. And this is uh, the power of a mathematical model. The ocean can also be looked at as a kind of tank. Uh, we did that when we are talking of aspect ratios. It is this potential of generalization that makes mathematical modeling so powerful a tool. So <coughs> we are not interested in just fitting observations. You could fit observations with a curve that uh, maybe a polynomial will do the job. Very high order polynomial could fit uh, most uh, kind of observations. Our interest is in getting insight into how the system behaves so that you don't have to go back to your computer all the time. You want to develop your intuition about how the system evolves. This insight is the real purpose of this course. Our interest is not in exact comparisons but in coming up with an explanation that is maybe the simplest possible to explain what we are saying. So if you are talking of the Witki jet, is it the Yoshida jet? It is a fairly simple explanation but do I need to make it more complicated than that? Is there something more to it? That is the question. That would be most appropriate in the context of this course. Okay. <coughs> So we are basically going to move on from here to looking at uh, the equations that are of interest. We go to chapter 4 of those lecture notes that were made earlier. Um, okay. The first and the simplest of the laws is conservation. And one reason for dealing with it in such great detail is that the basic uh, method of derivation is going to remain the same, irrespective of whether we are looking at uh, some term in the momentum equation or whether we are looking at conservation of mass. Now, one thing I'll have to test in this uh, class is whether I tried it yesterday at home 
you know, is whether I can draw something online while uh, <coughs> we discuss. It's something like writing on board. I'm not very good with a mouse, but we'll see. It wasn't too bad. I think some things can be done. <laughs> so in building a framework for understanding wind force circulation, we're not going to be dealing with tides. Where do we start? We have to begin, as we stated earlier, with a non-controversial universal law that is applicable to the physical system of interest. And the first one is the conservation of mass. It states that mass can neither be created nor destroyed. So we're going to accept that unless somebody has any objection to it. <coughs> okay, when we describe any physical system and want to write down any equations, the first thing we need is a frame of reference with respect to which we will write everything. And <coughs> the oceans are three dimensional, plus there is the change in time. So there is a time axis involved. So we're going to deal with this 3D space and with time. So we need to fix the frame of reference. We use a right-handed coordinate system. And uh, I shall, even at this early time, abandon sphericity. There are textbooks that will show you how to go from a spherical coordinate system to a Cartesian coordinate system. And I'm not going to spend time doing that. Uh, what we are doing basically is opening out the sphere, assuming it is flat. The problems then are the following. We know that we cannot ignore the sphericity we need to include in some form the fact that there is Coriolis acceleration and uh, that has to be built into the Cartesian frame that we shall uh, use. So though we are abandoning the spherical coordinate system, we are not abandoning sphericity and we are not abandoning rotation. We cannot do that in geophysical fields. <coughs> so we use a right-handed coordinate system this implies a right-handed screw. Now, if you turn a screw, it moves in one direction. So if you turn, for example, y-axis into the z-axis, you take your right hand and turn the y-axis into the z-axis, you find that your thumb points in a particular direction. That has to be the direction of the x-axis. Okay, x moving into y gives you the direction of the z-axis. <coughs> so in uh, what we do, we will take uh, the coordinate going east, west to east, as the positive x-axis. x increases eastward, the y-axis will point northward. And if you rotate the x-axis into the y-axis, you find that z has to be upward. So depths in the ocean are going to be negative. We can always write that as positive, but the coordinate z itself is going to be negative in all that we do. This is basically because we have to stick to uh, certain rules that are common in mathematical physics. And one of the most common of them is uh, the right-handed coordinate system. OK. Suppose you have a mass of water that's homogeneous. Its temperature and salinity are constant and incompressible. Its density cannot change. OK, uh, we can relax this uh, assumption, but as we shall find, it's um, though ocean water is not homogeneous, the assumption is still good enough. You have a lot of difference in salinity, for example, between the northern Bay of Bengal and the northern Arabian Sea. It's 7 PSU. And the rule of thumb is, uh, as far as density or stratification is concerned, uh, 1 PSU is something like 4 degrees Celsius equal to 4 degrees Celsius. So if you were to look at the uh, difference between the Northern Bay and the Northern Arabian Sea in uh, temperature terms, we're talking of something like 20 to 30 degrees Celsius temperature difference. That is the equivalent in stratification. So it's a huge. Almost neutrally stable near the surface. So if we make this assumption that water is incompressible, then the conservation of mass reduces conservation of volume. Density is out of the picture. You cannot generate volume or accumulate volume in a given space. So if I take a box, say something like this bottle, then uh, 
if it was air and I were to take a pump and attach it to the uh, rim and apply pressure, I can pump in air, I can put more air in, I can uh, suck the air out, create a vacuum. But what we are saying is that when you're talking in terms of ocean water, you cannot do any of that. There's a certain volume here and that's it. You cannot uh, accumulate any more in that space, in that physical space, nor can you um, No, no, it's running. Ring. Sorry, there was a problem with the network connection. It broke. Uh, we are back and we'll. Uh, okay, the broadcast is going on. Going. Okay, it's continuing. Fine. Sorry about that. The connection just broke here. <coughs> Okay, so what we have here is a box. <coughs> it's uh, got uh, rectangular sides, and you have the x-axis coming out of the plane of the paper, board, or laptop, whatever you call it. 
the y axis points this way and the z axis is vertically upward <coughs> the box has uh, dimensions delta x delta y and delta z in the x y and z directions and <coughs> we have point a out here which has coordinates x y and z therefore point b that is diagonally opposite over here has coordinates x plus delta x sorry x plus uh, delta x right y plus delta y and z plus delta z okay <clears throat> so point a has coordinates x y z and b has coordinates x plus delta x y plus delta y z plus delta z fine we look at two faces of this uh, six faced box on the left we have face xz1 along the x and z axis perpendicular to the y axis <clears throat> so the if you are looking at uh, if you say that this uh, point here now if you say it is x y z and we also have to look at time time t if you have a quantity here that is f of x y z t then the face opposite that is face x z 2 is at same x same z but at different y it's at y plus delta y okay so we are looking at a quantity here that is at x y plus delta y z and t now this is <clears throat> what we can call a parcel a fluid parcel so we are looking at a fluid parcel by definition a parcel has enough molecules in it to permit definition of quantities like density and pressure which cannot be defined for individual molecules so <clears throat> the box here is big enough to allow us to define density and pressure and temperature which according to statistical thermodynamics is also uh, dependent on the statistics of molecular motion <clears throat> so these macroscopic quantities like pressure temperature and density can be defined for this box it's small uh, it's uh, big enough for us to be able to do that but at the same time it's small enough for us to be able to define a representative density for this box so if i take my x y z t at the center of this box i can define a density for that and it does uh, the box is small enough that when i go to the to ends on either axis uh, the density has not changed by a significant amount so i can actually define a density which means two conditions that are mutually exclusive have to be satisfied the box has to be small enough to permit the a density to be defined in the sense that there is only one density that you define for the box not more than one it is big enough for you to ensure that these macroscopic properties can be defined because they are based on statistical averages of molecular motion so if that is the case so what we are looking at here is a box fixed in space its side aligned with the coordinate axis if you look at a large box as we shall finally do when we look at finite difference equations that we solve in a computer we would call it a control volume if you are talking in terms of classical fluid flows and you are talking in terms of the differential equations differential equation that describes the quantity uh, conservation of mass we are talking of a parcel fluid parcel so its dimensions length of its edges are delta x delta y and delta z and therefore its volume is delta v capital v delta x into delta y into delta z the coordinates of point a are x y z and that of point b are x plus delta x y plus delta y z plus delta z if a and b are diagonally opposite and a is at uh, this end so x z1 is one side of this box normal to the y axis and having point a is one of its corners x z2 is the other side normal to the y axis and this point b is one of its corners so the cross sectional area of each of these two sides is delta x into delta z you have delta z into delta x that defines the area 
Control volume is nothing but inventory volume of the second left of the box. Uh, question is about control volume. We'll come back to it later. As of now, I'm interested in just defining what uh, is a fluid parsing. If you were to talk in terms of finite differences, you would call it a control volume. If you were to talk in terms of uh, the limits, as we shall be doing, you're going to call it a parcel of fluid. When you take a control volume, you're talking in terms of finite differences, you can no longer apply a limit. It does not make sense. But we shall be doing that here. OK. So the cross-sectional area is delta x into delta z for these two faces. And we have assumed they're rectangular faces. So delta x into delta z is the area of both of these faces, whether you look at the left one or the right one. Now suppose f1 denotes the flux into or out of the left face, and f2, which is f of x plus x, y plus delta y, z, t, is the flux into or out of the second face. Okay, so f1 denotes the flux normal to side xz1, that's the one on the left, and f of x, f2, that's a function of x, y plus delta y, z in t, denotes the flux normal to xz2. Flux is basically rate of change. The arrows depicting these fluxes are shown pointing out of the box. It's always shown pointing out of the box because this is a positive direction, and the vector that denotes the area, usually denoted by a bold face n or n with a hat sign on it, if you are writing, points out of the box. The normal vector points out of the out of the box. So that is the sign convention. So if f1 is to be positive, it must be coming out of phase xz1, and if f2 is positive, it must be coming out of phase xz2. That is the positive uh, quantity. OK. Now, why are we bothered about these two sides? Uh, suppose you want to consider what is going into the box and coming out of the box? What is the flow of uh, water into and out of it? Since you have rectangular boxes, and we have rectangular boxes, and we've arranged it carefully, such that its uh, sides are along the coordinate axis. If you're looking at the, a side that is uh, normal to the y-axis, all flow through it must be along the y-axis. If there is flow along the x-axis, it will just slip along the box. And if you have a u component, it will just go along the box. It does not contribute to change within the box. So likewise, if you have a w component, it's going to be along the box. It does not contribute to change within the box. I just want to determine how much water passes into or out of the box across this side. So I don't need to worry about all velocity components. Now I'm concerned only about v. That is the velocity component in the y direction. And that is the one that's normal to this side. It's the only one that causes flow into or out of the box. So I assume that the velocity field varies sufficiently slowly that v is representative of the velocity component normal to this side. If my v changes from one uh, point on this side to another, then I can't really talk in terms of a representative v. But I have defined my box carefully. I have defined my parcel to be small enough for a v to be defined. I have. Uh, taken that care. Now, if that is the case, if v is the velocity component in this direction, if v f x y z t defines the velocity representative of this uh, phase, then the volume flux through this phase x z1 will be v into delta x into delta z. Because v is nothing but delta y by delta t. So it's the amount of volume that is going in through this space. And that's all that's stated here. V of x, y, z, t causes flow of water into or out of it. The units of this flux are in meter cube per second. Because V is meter per second, delta x and delta z are both in meters, meter cube per second. The velocity component normal to the side x, z, 2 is V. But now at x, z and t, but y plus delta y. That's the only thing that changes. 
So the flux for the side is given by V at x y plus delta y z comma t into delta x into delta z. That does not change. I need to assign a sign depending on whether the water is flowing into or out of the box across xz1. The convention is that the outward normal is considered positive. This is standard convention in mathematics. Hence, we have to attach a positive sign for the flux x across xz2. Why? Because the outward normal would show flow out of the box. So we assign a sign plus to it. The arrow shown here is in positive direction, but V is in the opposite direction. So if you take the dot product of the velocity vector, you are no longer bothered about uh, I and J. You are bothered only of I and K. You are bothered only about the J coordinate. When you take the dot product of the velocity with this outward normal, that is N, you will get minus V. Is that okay? So you get a positive sign for the velocity on the right side and a negative sign on the left side, simply because of the sign convention. Once you have done that, there is nothing else that can be changed. Everything else is not going to follow from these definitions. That is why it is critical to choose your sign convention carefully. Once we have done that, everything else is algebra. Summing these two fluxes gives me the net flux out of the box in the y direction. That's all I do. So if I am interested in the flux in the y direction, out of the box, I have v at x, y plus delta y, z, comma t into delta x into delta z. That is on space, across space x, z2 minus v at x, y, z, t into delta x into delta z. Basically, I am adding the two fluxes. All I am doing is ensuring I have the right sign for the velocity component. If uh, my v, since my outward normal and v, the positive v, point in opposite directions at x, z, 1, I get a negative sign for that phase. Since the outward normal and the positive sign of v are in the same direction for x, z, 2, I get a positive sign. That's it. So this is the net flux of volume out of the box in the y direction. Note that the net flux is positive if it is out of the box. This is in keeping with a sign convention that it is the out outward normal that is positive. Now, we assume, and we have already done that, that the box is small enough that the velocity variation across the distance delta y is small. Once we have done that, we have v at x, y plus delta y, z, t must be equal to v at x, y, z, t plus delta v at x, y, z, t. All that we are doing here is truncating the Taylor series at the first term. We are keeping only the first term in the Taylor series. If you were to look at the expansion for v in the neighborhood of x, y, z, t, and we are looking at it now only in y, you would uh, write v at y plus delta y equals v at y plus delta v by delta y at y into delta y. The first term in the Taylor series. We have kept only that. We cancel out the delta y's and we are left with this delta v. So all we have done is retain the first term in the Taylor series. And that is why this distance delta y has to be small enough for that to be possible. To the extent that this is small, this truncation is valid. Now note that delta v is not the same as delta y or delta z or delta x. I am fixing delta x, delta y and delta z. These are the sides of my imaginary box of control volume or parcel. So x, y, z, uh, they are determined, uh, these are independent variables and so is t. I cannot fix delta v likewise. It is determined by the flow. I determine delta x, delta y and delta z. 
I decide where to place the box. I decide x, y, z, and t. And then if I, by saying I'm deciding x, y, z, I say that I'm deciding where I make my measurement. That's what I'm doing in the context of uh, putting a probe out there to measure the velocities. That I have decided. But I cannot decide the changes in the velocity. That's controlled by the flow itself, the properties of the flow. V is a dependent variable here. So now we combine uh, these two equations, 4.1 and 4.2. We have uh, V at y plus delta y into delta x delta z minus v at y into delta x delta z. That's giving me the flux out of the box. And uh, we have here what is v at y plus delta y given by this expression. So if you combine them, you get the flux is equal to delta v into delta x into delta z. So what does this mean physically? I found the net flux of volumes through the box in any direction now because the same thing will repeat for the directions. It is just that uh, if I were to look at fx, delta x will be replaced by delta y and delta v will be replaced by delta u. So the velocity component of interest will be the one uh, given by the superscript because that decides the axis to which these faces are perpendicular and uh, the other two sides will contribute to the area of that uh, side. So that's all. It means that the net flux of volume through the box in any direction is equal to the product of the change in velocity in that direction and the cross section area of the side of the box normal to that direction. That's it. If the velocity was the same, that is the flow field was uniform, that is v at y plus delta y was equal to v at y, there would be no change in volume and that is exactly what you expect. What goes in comes out. No change in volume inside the box. But uh, that's not necessarily what happens in fluid flows. Uh, the net flux is not necessarily zero. So I allow for a non-uniform flow. The velocity across the two sides differs by delta v, which is what we have uh, done here. The box has six such sides, so I have three pairs, of which I have considered the two normal to the y-axis. Likewise, I can have flows across the sides normal to x and z-axis. So these are the fluxes as you would expect fx is delta u into delta y into delta z and in the z direction you have fz equals delta w into delta x into delta y. Individually each of these fluxes can be non-zero. I can have a non-zero fy, a non-zero fx and a non-zero fz. None of them has to be zero. But their sum is the net flux out of the box. And we have already made the assumption that we are looking at a fluid whose density cannot change. So there is a physical space defined by that parcel or control volume and that physical space defines a volume that cannot change. So the net flux of volume has to be zero, which means if I sum fx, fy and fz, I must get zero because there can be no change in volume inside the box. That's all we do. So delta u into delta y into delta z plus delta v into delta x into delta z plus delta w into delta x into delta y equals zero. Now we divide by the volume of the box. That's delta v, capital V equals delta x delta y delta z. And we get delta u by delta x plus delta v by delta y plus delta w by delta z equals zero. That's it. Now we take the limit as the volume of this infinitesimal box shrinks to zero and it gives us the required differential equation stating the law of conservation of volume. Do u by do x plus do v by do y plus do w by do z equals zero. In vector form, if the bold face uh, notation u denotes the velocity vector and uh, this operator is called nabla, it's uh, do by do x into i plus do by do y, do y into j plus do by do z into k where i, j, k are the unit vectors and the x, y, z directions. And we can write divergence of u or del dot u equals zero. The term on the left hand side here is called the divergence. And for an incompressible fluid, it is equal to zero. That's it. That is the law of conservation of volume. In words, we may state it as follows. Divergence of velocity equals zero. The velocity field is non-divergent. It is also the definition of incompressibility. So if you are asked for the definition of an incompressible flow, this is sufficient.
divergence of V written as del dot uh, V or del dot U equals 0 or div V equals 0, div is how you often write it. That's it, is equal to 0. Now, what we have done here is to take the limit and in the process, we say here that the volume of the infinitesimal box shrinks to 0. But in reality, what we are saying is that it shrinks to a point where you are actually talking in terms of that entity that we call a fluid parcel. So you are not going down to a scale where you start looking at molecular motion. You are not going down to those scales. Statistical averages of molecular motion still apply. Nor is it big enough for the limit not to apply. So it's small enough for the limit to make sense, but big enough for statistical properties. Measure a statistical property. Temperature is a statistical property. And uh, so is density. All of them apply. This uh, law of conservation of volume is a good law because many fluids are incompressible. Even air can be considered incompressible for many uh, applications. When you assume incompressibility, one of the things that goes out is sound. So if you assume incompressibility, you cannot talk of sound propagation because sound depends on compressibility. It's a compressible wave, a compression wave that uh, passes through a fluid the medium. So the moment you make this in assumption of incompressibility, you throw out uh, sound waves from the problem. Now there are many times when you will want to consider mass, not volume. Atmosphere is an example. Mm -hmm. Pressure decreases as you will break a few minutes here. as you go up, and density decreases as a consequence. So I need a law that allows me to conserve mass even when volume is not conserved. I need a mathematical statement that allows mass to be conserved even when density changes. Mass still has to be conserved. We have come up with conservation of volume, and the reason for doing it first is because the method of deriving the equation can be shown more easily here. The normal practice is to derive the full equation and then make the assumption. What has been done here is to go the other way around because it's much simpler to do it that way. And historically, that's how it get, got done. What we have done so far is useful because we have seen how one needs to operate in order to construct a general law. We shall now use the same approach to derive an expression for conservation of mass. And maybe it's time to break here. We will start again after about 15-20 minutes. So we will start again after about 15-20 minutes. Uh, if there are any questions on this part, we will take that first and then go on to looking at what happens when you allow density to vary. Is that okay? I am not sure if your microphone is mute or not mute. Well, they have muted it. Yeah, okay. Yeah, okay, sir. Okay, so we'll take a break now and come back after a short while. Okay, okay, sir. Fine, and uh, this is where my experiment will start. I'm going to use GIMP to see if I can draw things. I'm not sure how it's going to go because our camera is not good enough to uh, catch what is written on the board. So that's going to be a bit of a problem. So I'm going to use GIMP and see if I can draw uh, with the mouse and uh, if that can make some sense. Okay, 